Oh, good. Well, here we're recording. We're 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 um we're having it. Way. We're having this it. This is it. This is it. I like it straight in. Bang. This is it? Well, we, but you're an experienced man when it comes to podcasting, and I think that's why um I've started listening to your to your podcast, and since I sort of discovered it was more more your company, um, right? All conditions media that I, I found first on Instagram as things happen these days. And then yeah. I start researching, you jump on LinkedIn, you get to the, oh, who, who started that? What's the background? What's the history? And then found you yeah. and your podcast and now started reading the book. And it, it goes from there. You've had a real interesting career. And even your podcast journey, when did you start the show? Uh, I began my, uh, when was it? Mar- March 2017, basically. Ah, okay. Yeah. And what took you into yeah. podcasting? Because I know your, your background is sort of the written word and, and more sort of print, but what took you into podcasting? Um, well, I listened to a lot of podcasts at the time. Um, I'd been... So I got into podcasts quite strangely, actually. Like, I've obviously always been aware of them. I had a mate years ago who was into like, the Ricky Gervais podcasts because mm-hmm. they were like the sort of original ones, weren't they? I think mm-hmm. I think Russell, like in the UK, that is. I think Russell Brand and Adam and Joe and Ricky Gervais were probably the first people that actually had like significant podcasts, weren't they? That's probably like about 12, 13 years ago. And then I started listening to podcasts quite seriously about 10 years ago. Um, I was writing a script at the time and I was basically like trying to, absorb as much information as I could about script writing and there's turns out there's a load of script writing podcasts um so it kind of I started listening to this one called script notes which is really really good still going in fact um I don't listen to it so much anymore but the guy um who was one of the presenters on that it's a guy called Craig Mazin who who ended up doing uh Chernobyl like who wrote Chernobyl so like you know they're legit they're legit Hollywood people yeah. and they and they just did this great podcast that I really enjoyed and then I just sort of started listening to more and more you know it's like commuting a bit go to the office like on the bike and so quite naturally I started looking for like action sports podcasts and that at the time there just there weren't any really I mean there's a couple but they're a bit shit um so yeah I just probably a bit like you just just ended up sort of going oh yeah, that's, that could be cool. Like maybe I should do that. So I got quite fired up by the idea and I just, um, yeah, I just cracked on really. Um, it's, it's a similar journey. And obviously listening to shows that you've been on and, and reading things about your backstory, we've got on, on this sort of, in the podcast realm, in this world, we have got similar tracks because I, I, I hadn't listened to many podcasts before I started the first one. I got the idea, found a producer at the time and the rest is history. Yeah. Got the first one done. I remember sitting there trying to read off my first introduction, shaking, <laughs> getting it all yeah, wrong. Same. My guests, my guests, <laughs> my guests are sitting right beside me, going, "Jesus, what is this all about?" It, yeah. it just takes time. But my goodness, has my show evolved? Has your show evolved over the years? Of you had to sort of move with the times and trends. Um, probably not actually. <laughs> no, it's 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 quite similar, really. I mean, yeah, it's funny you say that because you don't really know what you're doing do you and I think when you start out you're you have all those sort of because no one likes to sound their own voice do they so like you know you, you, like I was I was I was fully like I just thought oh well everyone's going to find this quite annoying really um, I, I I know this probably sounds disingenuous but I, I genuinely did not have any expectations that people would like it I just it like it was an idea that I just thought yeah that's a good idea I'm just going to do it and at the time like my company was like it's just quite full on working, running the company that I run with my friend Jojo. And, you know, at the end of the day, like we're a marketing agency and we do, we're lucky enough to do um, interesting work with interesting brands, but it is, it is marketing, you know, it is like sales essentially. Like, so I just wanted something that was a nice little outlet for um, something I could be like a bit creative with and a bit, and, and also like have complete, control like editorially and in terms of like the way that I presented it to the world um so that was that was like literally the only ambition I had and in terms of like the it's not really changed I mean I kind of realized quite quickly that listeners like uh, repetition to a certain degree like there's a familiarity and repetition isn't there like so I I've got sort of well let's just say somebody once sent me a 
Alyssa once sent me a bingo card of, uh, of all the phrases that I overuse and repeat and the little sections and the little rants that I have. And I quite like that because I think, I think like you can get, you can get more self-referential, can't you, the longer it goes on and people start to like that. So I think in terms of it evolving, that stuff evolved, certainly, but fundamentally it's me, it's similar to you, it's me and a microphone and, and a guest. Don't particularly plan it. Like if they're quite famous, I do, I do a bit more planning just, just purely because they've been interviewed so many times that it's quite difficult to not get them to tell the same stories. So yeah. you, you, you know, you've got to find your angle there, aren't you? you've got to find your way in. That's going to be a bit different. So I do, I do a bit more prep when the person's pretty established or well-known, but generally I, I do follow what sounds like to your approach, just sort of press record and then see where we end up really. That's what I like. And when guests sort of send me, can you send me, can you send me questions before we record? Can you send me this? Do you want it? And I said, ah, I won't have any, you know, yeah. um, I'm really sorry, but this is just a conversation. I will ask questions. Yeah. Things will come into my head as we go through the show that I think, Oh, what yeah. was that like? Or how did you do that? Like one question for you was as I'm going through all con media on Instagram, my background is rugby. I still work in a, a corporate hospitality hosting events for rugby and Edinburgh rugby and things like that. And you obviously yeah. have close ties with Adidas and I see all con yeah. media with the all blacks. Yeah. How, that was the job we did last year. Yeah. How did that come around and how did you enjoy that? So, I mean, to me, the all blacks, obviously I'm, I'm Scottish, sport Scotland, but kind of yeah. everyone's other team, they want the All Blacks to play well. You want to see the All Blacks doing their thing. What was it like yeah. for you and your team working with sort of the, that All Blacks culture? Uh, well, to be honest, that job was quite pretty quick turnaround. Like, so we, I did ask one of our main clients and we work across a lot of different sports for them. So we do, uh, we do all that. Well, not all that, but we, we work across a lot of their outdoor categories. So like running, trailing, and it's Terex, essentially, that's Terex. Yeah. We work with 510, who like cli climbing and mountain biking. Um, we work with swimming, cycling, and those those two are run under like the ages of, it's called specialty sports. Because um, I did ask like all those big companies, it's divided into like what they call business units. So like football will be one you know, like, cause that's a huge business on its own. And then there's originals is a huge business on its own outdoors of business. And this, and this area is uh, especially sports. And we've got, a, we've got like a, a relationship with them and, and they literally just got hold of us and said, Oh, we've got the all blacks next week for like two days. Um, can we do something? Um, so we were like, okay, what do you want to do? Cause obviously it's always linked to like campaigns and launches and products. So that, so when you work with somebody like that, that part of it's always pretty clear. You know, they're like, well, we're, we're launching this on this day. We've got this product. We need to, we need this messaging. We need this, that, and the other. Um, can you come up with a creative concept and organize the shoot? So that was like, and it, it, it really was like, that. like, you know, they called me on a Thursday and it was like, it's on Tuesday. Um, and, then, and, and then to complicate things further, it was like, and we've got to do it near Heathrow Airport because we're all staying at Heathrow Airport. And we've got to follow strict code with protocols and it's got to be on grass and you know like so so that it, it's just like a logistical challenge really on that one actually i brought in a close friend of mine a guy called nathan gallagher who's a pretty established photographer um who works he's just really used to working with like proper sort of talent as they say in the business you know like so he works with like ronaldo andy murray um like his client list is like through through brands like but he's now got to the point where like if Ronaldo's doing a shoot, he wants to use Nathan, you know, like, so, so I was just a bit like, as you say, it's the all blacks, it's tight schedule. You don't want to fuck around. Sorry if I'm allowed to swear. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to get, I'm going to get Nathan so that, um, so that he, so that we know that they're going to be handled properly and it's going to be super slick. Not that, you know, cause you just want to want to do that. So it went pretty smoothly in the end. Like, I think I, I actually didn't, I helped organize it. I didn't actually, actually work on the shoot because I've got a, quite a big team these days so um you know I've got a team that kind of works with that client and then we've got a creative director so so the creative director kind of oversaw the you know the, like the the creative side of it and and then the team put it together so yeah it's, it worked pretty well I kind of asked for hyped so it was all good how's that how have you had to maneuver the business because seeing a recent post recently the the whole team got together in London and your yeah. company now is very remote the way the world is now and the way zoom is how does yeah. that work logistically obviously you get your creative director do you just 
do you do you have are you you have the capability to drop something or a project that you're working on to make it fit for the All Blacks? Do you know what I mean? How how do you work this sort of reaction time to to get that done, to get that signed off, and get the All Blacks happy, move on, or back to the next job? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, the first part of your question, how have we had to evolve? Wasn't it like um, like frequently, constantly? You know the like the post that you're referring to, I said something like, you know, we formed in 2005 and it was a, you know, it was a freelance writing agency. And it was, it was literally me and a mate of mine who had just got fired would be harsh, but we'd been let go from a job that we liked very much. We used to run a snowball magazine together and, you know, that reached the end of the road. We've been doing that 10 years and um, we were a bit like, what are we going to do now then? You know, <laughs> like, we're going to have to get a job here, um, which would suck. Cause like, you know, the, the whole, the whole time we'd been doing it, this magazine, like through our twenties, it was an excuse to go snowboarding. I mean, it, and, and a great one. And it was a great job. You know, it was a really brilliant opportunity. Got to travel the world, got to work with all my friends. Um, so we, so obviously I was a bit good when that, when it, when it became apparent that was going to end. And I was just turned 29 so at the time this is 2005 so we 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 were a bit like okay well maybe we could because because what we'd always done with the magazine was like positioned ourselves as the people that knew the most about like that scene which we were to be fair at the time and you know we always had a lot of brands that wanted to work with us because it was hey snowboarding it's cool you know it's all that stuff at the time um you know, you probably remember like the Pepsi Max ads and all that, you know, it was like a real thing that people used to try and sell and they did it really badly. So we, we were always quite scathing about that. So whenever, so we used to do a lot of work with brands and we used to, we used to kind of position ourselves as the people that, you know, if you want to do this, you might as well do it credibly and you might as well do it in a way that's not going to piss off the people that actually do it. So that's, that was our idea for a business as a freelance writing agency. You know, we were like, well, we could we could do that. You know, we could we could basically write articles about this for main, for, for the media, um, and so we did that for like that that sort of iteration of the business. If any of my people that work for me now listen to this, they're going to find this absolutely hilarious. I think. Um, like, we, so we did that for like probably six years. We brought in another friend of mine who ran an Australian surf mag called Tracks, which is a really well-known Aussie surf mag. And he's a close mate of mine. And he wanted to move to the UK from Australia. So we gave him a job and got him a visa. So there's basically three of us at that point. And, and then the, the globe, you know, the old, what they call it, the GFC, the global financial crisis, like I can't remember, the recession we call it, I think, don't we? The credit um, crunch. The credit crunch, that's what we call it, isn't it? Um, and the GFC is what the Aussies call it, in fact. And like at that point, you know, it was, it was pretty dicey. Uh, like, and, and, and again, we had the thought like, oh, no, we're going to have to get jobs here. Um, so we, we at that point, it, it, we, I was a bit like, OK, we probably need to actually commit to the market inside of this because we were still... We were, we were beginning to do more and more work with brands and that all, that obviously paid way more lucratively than doing the journalism, much as I love the journalism and like the journalism evolved into, like I had a good sort of eight year stint as a pretty much a full-time travel, travel journalist, which was like really good fun. Like basically again, extended the lag from the twenties of traveling and getting paid for it really. Um, and then the, and then, and then, and then like we, yeah, like we kind of rebranded ACM and that would have been, that would have been 10 years ago. And, uh, and then it's kind of evolved into the business it is today from that point. But in terms of your question, like, have we had to evolve? Like it's constant. Like I actually wrote a blog last year for our, for our website. And it was like 10 things I've learned from running all conditions media. And the first point was like, your business model must evolve constantly because it, it, it just has to like it. If you don't, especially in something as weird as marketing and then as niche as the industry that I work in, if you don't try and evolve, it, it just won't work really. Like you have to. So I think we're going through another revolution at the minute. Well, we're going to rebrand again this summer. 
Um, and we've, yeah, I think it's a good point for us to sort of look at what we're doing and think, okay, are we, are we doing this? Where can we improve? Like, how, how do we need to change things? So I just think it's got to be a constant, really, um, in terms of like how you approach it. In terms of like the second part of your question, like how we balance it all and can be in a position where we can turn around something like that, all blacks brief. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is, that's probably the trickiest bit of it, really. You know, it's like any growing business, isn't it? It comes down to like resourcing how you manage it, really. You know, if you, I think we've got a lot better at that, um, like having the ability to do that, but it's a constant learning thing, really. You know, the, basically the more notice we get from clients, the better. Like <laughs> if, everyone was, uh, yeah. if everyone was sort of phoning up and saying, can you do this next week? It'd get quite stressful, I think. See, see, you touched on there. I mean, I've um, I know about your twenties and, and that job, and and you've you've openly said before that like, where might I not get a chance to go in the future? Let's go and snowboard there. You yeah, know? yeah, and that that is something that's um, t- t- even to me. I, I've been seventeen years in the property industry and traveled a lot, and be very fortunate. But you had that job, and you had this lifestyle that paid you. There's a quote in your book, and forgive me if I get is it Chris Cote. Chris Cote, yeah. Chris yeah. Cote. And I won't read the whole quote, but basically there's something he says about he gets a Tuesday off, he's designed his life. Do you think, have you, have you set your life up in a way now that you can, when you want to go surfing, you can go surfing? Do you know what I mean? We all sort of yeah. as- aspire to live a life that we've dreamt of or, or live a life that we can really live. Yeah, I've been very, very lucky with that. I mean, that that's how I've, that's how I've always tried to, you know, you, that's how I've always tried to like treat work really. Um, and when, you know, you said, you said like, you know, in your 20s you're getting paid to travel. Like I was about to say, like, not a lot. <laughs> I wasn't getting paid a lot of money, you know, um, but enough to, enough to do it and enough to have the experiences. But I think we did make a lot of real life sacrifices, you know, like, um, you know, it's just a trade off, isn't it? It's about, I guess it's about what you value, isn't it? Because, me and my friends, a couple, my friend that I set up that business with, this guy called Chris, he's like my, my oldest mate, from, one of my oldest mates from school, the guy I worked with at White Lines, the guy that I was sort of mentioned earlier. Um, we just made a choice to, to try and follow that kind of lifestyle because we really, really liked that lifestyle. And, and, and that, but then at various points, we were definitely like, ah, like, you know, we've missed the boat on, like, buying houses and, you know, like, I don't, like, the stuff that, the, the grown-up stuff that you tick off through your 20s and 30s, we definitely didn't really have that. And I think at times we were a bit like, ah, that maybe that was a bad call, you know, like, but equally, it has been about that, really. Like, it sounds quite, I was going to say dickish, like, <laughs> it sounds, it sounds, it sounds like it was all like quite calculated. It, it, it really wasn't calculated. It was more, it was more just like every decision that we made was, was about like trying to, cause it, it was a really good laugh. You know, I won't, <laughs> I won't, I won't lie. What, like, I'm, what, what I'm trying to get, what, or what I'm getting from this is that, I mean, but you for through your twenties, I mean, I, I can speak open. I mean, I, I worked, I don't regret. I've built a business. It, it looks after my family, you know? That it's taken a lot of hard work and like you yeah. say credit crunch we've just gone through covid we've gone through some real really tough times yeah i'm in the property industry and that that took took a bit of a paste in several times over the last 17 years yeah. other people have been much worse however you were out there doing something that you absolutely loved and to me that's not doesn't sound like a dick that doesn't sound like something it's kind of me looking at that going nice one yeah well, d- d- well dickish, done. dickish is the wrong word like i i, I more mean like it's yeah like it it was i mean we did there was no plan like i guess that's what i mean like it in, if you talk about these things in hindsight it can it can sound quite like you know like oh yeah i always wanted to do that and that was the plan but th- there wasn't a plan like it was it was more the only plan really was like how can we go snowboarding and travel a lot really um and then you know like the, the interesting thing about running the business like excuse me like i mentioned after like the second iteration of it 10 years ago when it evolved into the market agency it is today was like i really enjoyed the challenge of that intellectually and i still really do um 
but equally has, I also really enjoyed trying to build that while maintaining the freedom that I'd always enjoyed so uh yeah I do I do have that freedom really like I can I can like I can go for a surf when I want or I can go away when I want like um and I I guess I've worked quite quite hard on the quiet to sort of get to that position really it's something that I like and again it was Chris Cote in, in your book and he says um again I'm I'm paraphrasing it's not exactly as he said it but he said it's okay to not be talking about politics and whatever else it's okay to be talking about playing on toys yeah you know and it's yeah. so true you're not taught that at school no you're not, you're not taught that by the way if you love snowboarding why don't you go and be a writer for a snowboard magazine why don't you go and do that or be a tour you're not taught that you're taught something different that get on that corporate ladder get that job go to university join the line basically yeah and get- yeah, I mean, I was I was very fortunate because I had a couple of close friends that were were were, were inspirational characters. You know, they they were like people that we all like. Well, one of them is Ed Lee, who is the ski Sunday presenter. So he's the guy that I he's one of the people that I grew up with snowboarding. I used to work on that magazine with, and the other one is this friend of mine, Chris. You know, like they they were just always when we were kids. They they just they 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 like they, 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 they led us really you know, because they, they were, they had, they had the confidence to do it, let's say. Kind of telling you it's okay to do this. Well, not even that, just doing it and just, and just like, well, Chris certainly at a couple of points, give me a kick up the ass and was like, because I, I think I had to learn on, you know, all those things that you've just said, like the path you're supposed to take through life. That was definitely what I'd expected for myself you know like I went to university I, I, I did my A-levels like I did all that and um, I expected to try and get a career as a journalist really because that was what like a, but like a traditional career you know like I work for a paper and like all that that was sort of the sum of my ambitions in my teens and because um, I always was a writer from when I was quite young but like those two friends Chris and Ed like definitely sort of showed me an alternative path in my 20s and also gave me a boot up the art like kind of helped me uh, uh, like realize it was fine you know to yeah. not follow that path and and I did need that you know I did need those role models that 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 kind of w- w- were blazing that little particular trail you know yeah, and w- with your company Alcon Media w- what's the culture like there what w- what is it like working in the company for one of the team members, for the for the creative guys, for the for the girls that have to be there at nine o'clock for the old battle? What's it like as a team? Is it a lot of their, their own personal decision making or does it? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, we've worked really, really well. Again, uh, we went remote in January 2020 before COVID, which is a very lucky coincidence. And that was because there's a few reasons why we did that. I just thought it it would be much better for the business because I just thought well we'll be able to get better people fundamentally it's a basic thing isn't it you know if you if you can spread your pool wider you're going to get better people rather if you insist that they move to Brighton to work in an office like you just narrow in your options so we did that um and then we've just worked really hard to try and make it a good place to work and we don't always get it right like you know, we've gone through a big growth period recently and everyone's been really busy. Like that's that, and, and I, I'm pretty conscious of that. I don't want to overwork people. Like I, I'm serious about it being a good place to work with a good work-life balance. Like, so remote, like we, we just ask people to work. I think it's 11 till two. I see, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> like they have to be at their desk like 11 till two. And after that, they can do what they want as long as they get the work done. You know, they've got scheduled hours and they've got jobs that they've got to do. Um, and they need to tell people what they're going to do. So if they decide to take the afternoon off after two o'clock, like they've got to let people know. They can't just like disappear. And yeah. Um, but we just we just try and trust people. And similarly with the way that we trust people to do the work, like I'm not sure it suits everybody, but I'm I'm quite willing to give people quite a large amount of responsibility and let them get on with it and say, if you need my help, I'm around but I'm not going to hold your hand like, and because, because you'll be able to do it. Like, because I think, and sometimes that's backfired because I think 
sometimes when you're a boss you do need to give people more guidance and you know like that and that and also fundamentally that just doesn't work for every personality type some people don't respond well to that situation but by and large like we do try and give people a pretty large amount of personal autonomy and freedom to do the work the way that they like we're, we're pretty transparent as well like we're pretty transparent about budgets we're pretty transparent about there's a, there's a lot of trust involved you know like we're not, we're not we don't try and hide the nuts and bolts of the business um and in terms of like the culture we like yeah remote can be tricky i think i think we've learned a lot from being fully remote i think there's a few things you know like i said january 2020 we were all like jazz hands like we're here we're going remote it's gonna be brilliant and i think in the last couple of years we've been like mm, actually there's a few unforeseen difficulties with that that we need to guard against like which is communication clearly is way more difficult yeah if you're not all in an office it's just a fact of the matter um and that can breed problems so we've had to kind of understand that and and try and mitigate against that um and also fostering a spirit of community and, and team is obviously difficult you know we've had a couple of people start for us this year and the first time they met anyone was like last week when we all went to london and went skating you know yeah. so like um so that's that those are way days that we do are really important like we do those every two months um and we do one every every two months we do one where it's something like that where we'll go to a town and we'll hang out and then every other two months we'll do something a bit bigger where we'll maybe go surfing go snowboarding like in april we went up to aviemore and took everyone ski touring for a couple of days and um and it was good because like that for me that fosters more of a spirit of togetherness and community than if you're all sitting in an office bitching all day do you know what yeah, i mean yeah yeah, yeah like yeah, absolutely and, and i also think it instills in people <clears throat> I, I'm just, re I love seeing like people that work for us like thrive when they get it, you know, when it clicks, when they're, when, when they're like, all oh, right, they just trust me. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of people come in and they're like, where's the catch? This is like, this feels a bit too good to be true. Like there's got to be a catch. And, you know, when I, and when I, when we say to, like, well, you can, if you want to clock off early and you can to go surfing, you can do that. They're like, that can't be right. Like, you know, they, they, they're just a bit like, that can't possibly be right. And then when they when they realise that it is actually genuine, then, and they, they're, 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 pretty, they're pretty stoked, you know, and they're like, cool, I'm going to, I'm going to work hard and, and take this trust at face value and, and reciprocate it. And I feel like we're getting to the point where that's creating a genuine, unique culture. And which, is what the, we, which is what we want to do. Is the team U, fully UK based or does it stretch globally? Um, they're all over the place. Um, mostly in Europe. I mean, Mark, our head of creative, had to go back to Australia. So he was working from there for a month. Um, we've got Daniele, who just joined us, who's in Dublin. Um, most of them are in the UK. But I think, again, they're all beginning to realize that they can just move. Like one of them said to me the other week, I'm thinking of moving to France. And I was like, go for it. And they were like, well, you're not going to be annoyed. And I was like, no, that's the whole point. <laughs> like, you can live where you want. Like, you know, because I do that. I, I, I go off for weeks on it. Like I, like I not spend a lot of time in France myself. So like, you know, last year I was three weeks around Brittany in the van. I still worked. Like, it's just, that's, that's the whole point, you know? Yeah, and so do you still, what, what do you prefer now? Is it still writing or podcast talking? Well, they're all quite connected. I mean, there's still, I still do a lot of journalism. I mean, even this week, I've, I've been doing a story for an American snowboard mag. I did, a, I did a piece a couple of weeks ago for a British magazine, like a culture magazine. Um, uh, so that, that kind of ticks over. I did a piece for Wired earlier this year um and like they're all quite connected really like and they're all they're all rewarded in different ways like the podcast thing is going is going good like i've i've got some really fun projects on the go with that this year um which i'm which i'm pretty hyped about and the business is 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 an interesting point you know it's growing and and like like i say i'm enjoying the challenge of seeing how we can manage that growth while also maintaining this 
this culture that we try to have. So I kind of, I kind of enjoy it all, really. And where did the idea for this Looking Sideways book come from? Where did the... Because collating, it's been mentioned to me, over 200 shows, some extremely well-known guests on my show stick it in a book, turn it mm. into something on print. You know, that that's something that, I mean, they get after it podcast, get after it book, get after it, yeah, all sorts good. of stuff. You've done it. And you've got yeah. your relationship with Owen, your photographer. My yeah. guy's... Um, my, my guy's uh, on, on the video is called Rob and okay. we've, we've started we've done two sort of on I location like we, we've done two um, on location podcasts and they've been with particularly well known people yeah. and we've just got this idea of what's bubbling away and what we're going to what we're going to do with it where we're going to take the show and what we're going to what we're going to achieve and what sort of challenges are we going to set ourselves to, to go and get out there and basically get after it that's what we want yeah. to do yeah, You've done yeah. it. It's here. The, the the pictures are incredible. The people, the quotes, your interviews. You've collated it. So where did the idea come from? How, how did it? What was the process to get the book to print? Yeah, there's a few things going on with it, really. Like I, I um, I mean, first and foremost, me and Owen are like very close friends, and we've known each other a long time, and we are always like you know, for me, a big a big part of the appeal of setting up the podcast was to try and find ways of working with Owen. So like, you know, we did from the beginning, we did a lot of trips together where we would just go away and like he'd shoot and I'd do the interviews and it like not, we didn't get paid. It was just at that point, it was just, a, it was just a fun way of doing trips together. And we were lucky enough that we could, we could do that. And it didn't really, we didn't really mind if it cost a few quid. Like we went to Ireland quite early on. We went and did a few interviews over there. Um, so that, and then as the podcast kind of grew in popularity, um, I decided to try and organize this trip to California. Like, and I, I approached California Tourist Board basically. And I said to him like, you know, I've got this pod, I mean, I knew him all anyway through work, but I said, yeah, I've got the podcast, I want to go to California and we will go for three weeks and we'll do this trip. And I'm going to do like 15 episodes. We're going to get a load of commissions. So we got, I, I think we did a piece for Condé Nast Traveller. Um, I did a piece for, yeah, we did a few pieces. I can't quite remember. I did a few pieces for magazines. Uh, will you pay for it? And, and they said, yeah, because that's what they do. You know, they've got budgets. And if they if they think it's a good enough idea and they'll get enough publicity out of it, they'll do it. So, they, they, so they're like, right, we'll pay for it. Great, game on. So we planned it and... We flew to San Francisco. Well, I flew to San Francisco with my wife because that was just a stipulation that we said, <laughs> and can we bring our wives? Um, so me and my wife, Alima, flew to San Francisco. Uh, we, did a, we did a load of really fun stuff for a week. I, I swam from Alcatraz, which is pretty hectic. Uh, we went up to, we went snowboarding up in the Sierra Nevada. Hold on, did, hold on, hold on. Swam from Alcatraz. Yeah, I mean it's not that far actually, but it is quite hectic. <laughs> yeah, and it and it came it came about like quite randomly because I I've always wanted to do it. Like I'm quite into swimming. I've done a lot of like open water swims, and I've done a lot of like the kind of quite famous swims over the years, like um and not like nothing like the channel, like nothing like crazy long, but like more more like where you go somewhere interesting and do a, do a cool swim. Like I yeah. swam from. There's one in Turkey called the Hellespont, which is where you swim from Europe to Asia, for example, which is like 6K. So I've done that, you know, like, um, so, and I was just a couple of, it was quite random that I was on the phone to somebody about work. I can't even remember who it was now. And she said, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm going to San Francisco tomorrow. And she was like, I just swam from Alcatraz. And I was like, fucking hell, no way, really? And she was like, she's like, yeah, do you want to do it? Cause she knew that I was a swimmer. And I was a bit like, oh God, all right. Um, and she said, I'll put you in touch with so-and-so from Alcatraz Swimmers, like he'll, he'll guide you. And so I proper got my bluff called basically. Um, so I phoned this woman, kind of hoping she's going to say, I've got no spaces. And she's like, when do you get here? I said, well, I, I land tomorrow night, which is like a Wednesday. And she said, I can do Friday morning. And I was so meet me at the quay at like, like 6 a.m. And I was a bit like, okay, <laughs> like no, no getting out of that one. Um, so I went and did it and it was, it was mad. It was like, you, you, you met her at this little, very expensive yacht club in San Francisco. You get taken out on a, like a little, you know, dinghy, whatever they're called, like little, uh, out, you know, you know, you know, the kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 
you get dropped off at Alcatraz at dawn um, because because obviously there's hardly any ships in in the in the channel because it's a super busy shipping lane and you have to do it at slack tide because um, the fuck the, the tides are ridiculous like going through that bay so you, you've got 45 minutes to do it i think and it's an hour it's an hour no it's a mile and a half so it's actually to be honest like it's a pretty mellow swim it's not like it's it's not as hectic as, as it sounds but it's pretty eerie and when i because there was no one else really in the bay and when i when i jumped in she was like oh, i was a gray whale over there and i was a bit like Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was going to say that there's, there's apart from boats, there's danger in the water. Are the waters around there, are there sharks? I don't, I, I don't think there are. I asked her about that. To be honest, like the, the, the woman who I did it with was pretty funny because that's like what she does for a living, like guides people across that strait. What a job. And, and she was like, I think she'd done that swim about 300 times and she did it when she was seven months pregnant. So so she was a bit like, just get it done. Like, <laughs> get on you, know, with it. <laughs> get on, you know what I mean? She was like, it's not a big deal. This, just get it done. And um, and when and when like she mentioned about the whale, she was just like, just enjoy it. You're gonna swim across San Francisco Bay with a grey whale like next year. Like, so I was like, all right. Um, and uh, so yeah, did it, and it was it was really great. Um, so we did that. That was like that was day two. And then me and my wife drove up to, yeah, we went up to Sierra Nevada, went snowboarding. And then we drove, basically we did a week of that. I did about three interviews up there. And then we drove down to Ventura, which is about a four hour drive. And we met Owen and his wife who'd flown over to LA and they'd had a couple of days in LA. We had a few days with our wives, but we were then also bombing off and doing interviews. Like that was the Malibu section. That was when our wives were there. Um, our wives, Alima and Mariko flew home. And then me and Owen had 10 days to, to get from LA to San Diego. And I think we had about 12 interviews to do. Um, so we did that. And while it was going on, Owen was like, we've got a book here for sure. Like we've got a book, like I've got enough pictures. And we've got a really good routine going. Like he, he was, cause this is, obviously you do 15, 16 podcasts, whatever it is in two weeks. There's a lot of prep involved. <laughs> so I yeah. was, so I was, you know, I can tell you're really well prepared and there was a lot of people that I was speaking to that I wanted to be pretty on it with, you know. So I was doing a lot of research. I was really kind of contradicting what I said earlier about not not preparing. I actually really did prepare for most of the ones on that. Um, and it was really fun and it was really hectic. So we got home and I went back to Californian tourism and I said, I think we got a book out of that. Have you got any money? And she was like, she was like, yeah, I could, we could probably pay for that actually. How much do you need? And I said, oh, I think we need this much money. Um, and she's like, all right, great. Um, so this was end of 2019. And then obviously COVID kicked in. Actually the last meeting I had before COVID, before the day before lockdown was the Californian tourism board where they signed off the budget for the book. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, a month later, she, she's like, sorry, that's not happening because of COVID, you know. So we were at that point, we were a bit like, this, this is a this is like a year after the trip. Um, and, you know, we're all in lockdown. So we, we did it then because we were like, well, what else are we going to do? So let's just get it done. So um, we, we spent that summer putting it together. And I think we did it probably in the worst possible way because we didn't have a plan. Um, and, I, and I think it was a nightmare for Owen, actually, because Owen designed it. And I was a pain in the ass, really, because I, I kind of said, well, why don't you do a version and then we'll work it out from there, which in, is in hindsight is like the worst possible way of doing it. And he did. And I was like, well, it's great, but we've got to change all this and we'll do this, this, this. And then, and then, and then we did that about five times, actually. And um, by the end of it, we got that book that you've now seen. Yeah. Um, and we, we knew we wanted to self-publish it because I've been looking enough stuff for a few books published in the past and you just don't make any money. Like unless, unless like you, you, you look, you get an advance. And, but from my experience, like it's kind of predicated on the idea that that industry that you'll only just about pay your advance off and you'll never actually make any money. 
Yeah. Like I, I, I believe that's the business model really. So I didn't want to do that again. Um, so we found another, we found some sponsorship money from another brand that we were working with at the time. And, and then we spent the beginning of last year working on the publishing side of it and working out like, you know, how to do that and how to distribute it and how to sell it and all that stuff. So it was a really interesting project. It was, I think, I think we, I'm actually about to write, I do a newsletter every Friday and I've actually written a blog, which is like the five mistakes we made when doing the book because I've had a year to reflect on it. And I think we made some really, really bad mistakes. <laughs> so, give, give me, without, without ruining the newsletter, give me an example. Give me something that, because here, I might, I might pinch the idea, you know? I might, yeah, yeah, I might, I'd be happy to, to help, like, of course, like, having been through it. Um, I don't think we sold it hard enough. I think, that, I think that's probably, I'm not very good at that. Like, I, like I, I don't have ads on my podcast and, I'm not, I'm not super on it with, with like a, a lot of the kind of hygiene you should really be doing with your podcast. Like I don't do any SEO or any of that stuff. You know, there's all this stuff you can do that like people that are super on it do. I don't do any of that. And I think we didn't really think about how to sell it until afterwards. We were a bit like, oh yeah, okay, right. We better start, we better start working out how to shift this a bit. <laughs> um, I think we probably could have been a bit smarter with the format. Like, I think, the, I think we, I think we like, we wanted to really please ourselves because again, as I was sort of saying with, with the podcast, which is a bit of a reaction to like doing a lot of work where I don't have a huge amount of editorial control. It was a very self-indulgent project. You know, normally when you do a book, you've got editors, you've got people, commercially minded people telling you like what you should be doing. Yeah. We didn't give that any thought. You know, we were literally like, yeah, that, we really like that cover. You know, it's a really flash cover. It's fabric bound and it's like, you know, it's um, it's quite expensive. And I actually sent it to a book agent who I'd been, who I've been speaking to for a few years. And um, she was like, she was basically like, that is very uncommercial, that format. Um, and she was a bit like, and she gave me a lot of like, obviously like very well, you know, pointers that were coming from a place of expertise let's say so yeah. i appreciated that and i took that in the right spirit and i was like okay cool you know but that's what we did <laughs> yeah, well, i'm still gonna do it your way yeah so i think but i just can it, it, to, to me it's and i hope you take this the right way you know you walk into a, a nice lounge or living room and the coffee table books yeah i think you, that's, you know I mean? that's what we were sort of going for oh you know? it's there it's there and with the beautiful pictures and the the way it's written and the in yeah, it's fantastic. The, the way it's been captured. Yeah, like absolutely. Just, yeah, no, I don't say that as a I take that as a compliment because like that's that's what that's, was, yeah. that, that's what we would try to do, you know. Like we I've got a bookshelf of those books and surf culture is like that's a big part of surf culture, like that 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 hot, large format, beautifully photographed, beautifully designed, like reflective, like slow read, like that's that's a big part of surf culture. So we were quite keen on having something that fitted with that, you know, that kind of heritage really. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, I, hey, I think you nailed it. And, and I mean, it really, thank you very much. When, when you I think, how did it go? I invited you on this show, then straight back, you were like, what's your address? I was like, <laughs> yeah, you were a bit. I was, I was like, what? That, you? I was like, why? <laughs> why? why? Yeah. I'm outside your house, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I found you. And then you're yeah. like, I'm going to send you my book. And I was like, oh, yes. Don't mean it, but anything like that. And it, it wasn't even, had I discovered it, I'd seen the book and things like that. But when you get into the journey that you've been on, you know, and, and like you touched on earlier on, when you say you kind of design your life and you think, well, hey, let's go to California. How are we going to do this? How are we going to find a way? And you, you navigate to the tourist board. Or I'm sure if the tourist board wasn't there, you'd have navigated to a different brand or someone to make what you wanted to happen, happen, you know? Yeah, I mean, we got a good ground in, in that in, in, when we ran that magazine. Because yeah. one, one of the things we realised, well, it was the only way you could do it. Like, I was about to say one of the things we realised was that you could flag trips, but that, that's not even correct. Like, essentially, that magazine had no money. Like, it won't surprise you to hear. Like, a British snowboard magazine. I joined that magazine in 1997. There was no, there, there was a bit of money because there was people advertising. There's certainly probably more money in the game, weirdly, then than there is now, as in, like, the snowboard magazine game. But you couldn't really pull together a magazine 
without lagging you know mm. so and and like i said like we we wanted to do some some we wanted to see the world we wanted to do some weird trips and also i was quite serious about like you know snowboarding is it's very white it's very middle class it's very rich you know it's like you go to we used to call them islands for rich people you know you go to a ski resort and it's the same anywhere in the world it's just full of rich twats that, that <laughs> like and and there's not a lot of culture it's very homogenized like it's you know it's apro ski bars especially you go to like north america or you go to like like they're, they're, they're trying to do a version of what they think mountain culture is like in those glitzy resorts i think france is completely different because and, and there's certainly some areas in north america where it's they're blue collar ski towns that, that have a culture i'm not trying to say blanket it's like that but ski resorts as a place to visit are quite generic and mm. so for so for me i was like i'm not going to fill a magazine every season with like trips to whiteville you know i, I want to go somewhere different we want to we want to see the world like we can use this opportunity as a as a vehicle like literally and metaphorically so we, you know, we would be like, well, the ski resorts in in Asia, the ski resorts in weird places in Europe, the ski resorts in Greece, ski resorts in Lebanon. Like, let's go there. There's Turkey, the ski resorts. Let's go there. Like, you know, and 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 see, meet different people and see different cultures and see how snowboarding fits into their world. That was what we wanted to do, really. Uh, uh, forgive me. I listened to half of it this morning and I forget your guest's name on your most recent show, but he was born in Australia and learned to ski in Australia. Tim Myers, yeah. Tim Myers, Le yeah. Yeah, legend. Yeah, I mean, how's that for a random upbringing? Yeah. Next to an Aussie ski resort. I, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that was over there and there was a, there was a, an area that you could do that. There's a few. There's a few resorts over there. Yeah. yeah. And there's a proper scene. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, for me, I would, I would, I was way more interested in going to places like that, like where it's less traditional than, than just going back to, you know, Aspen again, like, which is very not traditional. I also, as I was trying to scan there for Tim's name, because I did take some notes for this, if I'm honest, but I also got beside, besides Tim's name. And let's not, let's not go too deep on this, because this is like a whole show in itself. But Tim wants to cancel Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that was quite funny, wasn't it? It was. That was out of nowhere. I didn't, when you asked him, because um, he's a videographer, he's a documentary maker, and he's, you know, been there, done it. And you are asking him, uh, what would he like to do himself? Has he got any ideas? And he said, well... I'll tell you, I don't want anyone to steal this idea, but cancel Christmas. But it was also Easter, you know, 4th of July, cancel yeah. them all. But because of the effect that it has on the world, because yeah. of the, simply the wrapping paper, cutting down trees, everything. And when he actually, I mean, I'm not, I'm all for Christmas. Yeah, me too. I love Christmas. I love Christmas. I do. Easter, I've got three kids, you know, they're all young and Easter yeah. is... It's ridiculous with chocolate, <laughs> with chocolate it's worse than christmas with chocolate yeah I, want, I like these occasions i like building to halloween i like doing all that but my god spend a fortune yeah. and the the recycle men the, the the bin men can't take away the amount of paper the amount of boxes and you need to go to the skip i mean that's how much stuff my family alone and it's, it's real you go through so actually when he dissected and explained why he said cancel christmas i understood it for the effect that it has on the world it was an interesting yeah. topic, though, wasn't it? It was funny. Yeah, he's a, he's a, I loved him. I only met him last week, and um, he's he he's a really really shrewd, clever, funny man. Like, and you know, it was all pretty tongue in cheek, all that. But he's quite serious as well. And yeah. I really like the fact he was a bit cagey about it. Like, he didn't want yeah. to talk about it. And I was like, come on, mate, spit it out. You know, spit it out. And, and when yeah. he's pitch, he's pitching it to like producers and that, and they're like me, that'll never go off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no i i really enjoyed that conversation he's he's a, he's a real real good guest that guy how do you see your industry i, I keep using the word evolve but I suppose, like we said you have to i mean but the way tiktok is now the way social media is now the way i don't know kids are on online too much but you need to get the eyeballs when you're doing these marketing campaigns adidas and the old banks are coming to you to get the eyeballs on the product to get the yeah. eyeballs and, and to get the interaction how do you see what you do changing in the course of time as things progress are you constantly seeing what the next tiktok is what the next social media platform is well i, I think there's two there's two things going on isn't there there's like i mean what you're describing are, are like channel they're almost like distribution channels for for right. ideas yep. you know like they're, 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 or communication channels they're like how ideas get spread aren't they 
Um, and yeah, certainly I, me as a mid forties old fart are gonna, are gonna use different communication channels than the kids I was in the house with in France last week that worked for one of the brands I worked with who were all in their early twenties, you know? So that stuff changes constantly, but the, the fundamental aspect of it, which is a good idea and a good creative concept executed really well, hasn't really changed. You know, like that, that, that will never really change. You know, like the currency that we work with is ideas, really. You know, like the, the campaigns are about, good ones are about original ideas that, that, that communicate something emotional effectively. And like, and then how you distribute that idea is a whole other category, is a whole other topic even. But, and yeah, you need to you need to stay on top of like what those conduits are and like who's using them and you know that's why I employ a lot of people who are a lot younger than me fundamentally. Um, but they are two separate things, I think. I mean, I'm not sure if you've seen that new Calm campaign. Have you seen that at the minute? I saw you posted about it. I haven't. I haven't that's the best it. thing I've seen. In, I'm going to say in years. Like it's it's incredible piece of work. You know, it's like it's so simple. It's it's basically people's last social media posts before they commit suicide. And then they've got their families to write a piece about how they felt when, and, and, and every single one is like, we had no idea and it's destroyed our lives. And I just wish I could see him again. And you know, the, the stuff you would expect. I cried looking at that. I honestly did. I went through this thing. There's like, there's like probably 30 people, individuals involved in it. The cumulative effect of that and it's just such a simple idea. You can totally see how somebody in a, in, a, in a meeting would have gone, well, why don't we do this? You know, but the way that they've like pulled it together, the emotional impact of it and, and the effectiveness of it as a vehicle for the message that organisation is trying to get across and the really clever way they've distributed it. You know, they did a thing on this morning. They've done an exhibition on the South Bank. They've advertised all over social. So they've really taken care of all different levels of media to get it out yeah. there. It's just an absolute class piece of work. And I, I, I actually messaged the guy that made it. I found out who made it um, and sent him a message and said, I just want to tell you, like, how impressed I am. And, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a brilliant piece of work, basically. And that that's just a good idea. You know, that's just that's just somebody's just come up with a really brilliant idea. And that's... That doesn't change, I don't think. Do you, are you constantly thinking of new ideas for something that might fit into a, a rugby campaign or a cycling campaign or something like that? Or does it usually come when you've got the um, you've got the product or you've got the, the company, the brand, and then the ideas will start sparking? Or do you have sort of little things, a notebook or something, you write away, that might work one day? Yeah, like I, I mean, I'm a big believer in like the more you put in, then the more options you give yourself. You know, I've always been somebody who's like an avid consumer of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm... Um, yeah quite notorious among my friends for that like um I've, I've just always been able to take on board I'm, I'm quite a curious person really so like I like I, I'm, I'm, I'm and I just really enjoy finding out new things and I enjoy going down rabbit holes on certain topics like I've, I've been a big reader my whole life you know like I'm I try to sort of I try well it's not even a try to stay current like I think it's I think it's just part of who I am. Like I just do as an, I'm happy. So I'm taking on a lot of info. Um, so that, I just think the more you fuel that, the better chance you give yourself of, of being original personally. Like, um, and I've certainly seen that. Like the more reference points that you have, the more you can empathize with different people's viewpoints, the more you understand different stories, the more you, tr not even, the more you try and empathize with other people's stories that aren't necessarily where you come from, like all that you just give yourself a better chance of, of, of having interesting things to say, I, I think personally. So um, I certainly found that doing the podcast, I certainly found that interviewing people like, cause you know, it's not rocket science, but everyone's into different shit, aren't they? <laughs> so, that, that's it. And, yeah. and re reaching out to you and knowing you've got a podcast and, and like I say, write a couple of notes, but nothing's really been referred to in the notes that I did write down. I forgot what his name was, you know? So yeah. it's one of these things. It's, it's, it's finding reference points. It's going down tangents, going down rabbit holes and God, I love this podcast journey. Yeah, it's great. I, I think, I think also not trying not to be blinkered, 
you know, like I think I think there's certainly in my game, as in the marketing thing that I'm into now, like um, people can have like can be have things they're into that they try and put into everything. You know, like mm -hmm. they can always be trying to crowbar this idea that they've got into different things and. I, I tr very much try not to do that. I very much try to like, just think about well, what's the right idea, the right approach, the right, excuse me, the way to, to try and what's, how can I bring in as many different things as possible that will give me the best chance of doing something original rather than being like, oh, I've got this great idea, let's do that. Cause it, it, you know, that's a bit pin the tail on the donkey for me really. Yeah. Well, hear me. I'm, I'm enjoying what you're doing. The book is excellent. I enjoy the podcast. I'm glad I discovered it. Um, and watching what Alcon uh, Media is doing, what your, what your brand, your business is doing, it's, it's of interest to me. And as I say, I jumped on the All Blacks, but you're, you're covering a lot of bases that I like, you know? So you well, sort thanks, of, mate. I appreciate it. It's really nice to have a chat. It's great. I've really enjoyed this and uh, I really appreciate your time. And thank you for getting back to me so quick on the email. I know um, you've probably got the same things as me, but you've always usually got to do a chaser. You maybe got to get, I have to get past a, a lot of uh, agents or gatekeepers, as I call them. It can be, it can be quite a challenge sometimes getting guests on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is why whenever people ask me to do stuff like this, I just usually say yes and, and just try and be quite mellow about it because I, I know what a pain in the arse it is <laughs> from the other side good on you well here yeah, i really appreciate it matt take care yeah no worries no worries